Welcome back. In this section of our discussion on returns, I'm going to discuss how we use historical time series data to analyze returns. So I'll start off using some real life data, some historical data to calculate our historical average and our historical volatility. Then we'll talk about the Sharpe ratio. And finally, I'll introduce a concept called value at risk, which is kind of our gold standard for portfolio risk metrics. All right, now, when we want to estimate past returns and volatility, typically we, we need to use a time series data set from some financial database. There are several databases we could use, but the best of these for our purposes are going to be either Yahoo Finance or the Bloomberg Terminal. Uh, there's others like the Words database, or in, for returns, it'd be the CRISP database, but you don't have access to that. Uh, so you need really this data to test any trading strategy. And when you download the data, you need to clean it first, then calculate the returns, then calculate the standard deviation of those returns. Uh, notice here that I'll use volatility and standard deviation interchangeably throughout this video. So just, just be aware of that. I try to keep it consistent, but in the investment space, volatility and standard deviation mean the exact same thing. Okay, so what are we gonna do? Well. I'd like to show you where you get this data from. So first things first, we're going to go to Yahoo Finance and we're going to type in the ticker symbol of a stock we want to get data from. We're going to get that historical data and then I'll show you how to clean that data. So uh, that's that. Let's get started. Okay, so I'm on the Yahoo Finance website and let's say I want to look up, oh, let's say Google. So I have Google loaded or alphabet loaded. And to get their historical data, I'm going to go over here to historical data and we'll be able to get their prices or the, the stock price for each day. So here we have the opening price of the day, the high price of the day, the low price of the day, the closing price, the price at close, uh, number of shares traded, so volume, uh, and then the adjusted close is the close adjusted for the effects of dividends. So firms that pay dividends or split, uh, this is going to account for the, the changes. So ultimately, the column here that we want to focus on more than any other is this adjusted close column because it, it takes into the effect, takes into effect the dividends that have been paid. Uh, so it's, it's kind of like your capital gains plus dividends are taken into account here. So, I can change the date of my data here. I can adjust it as needed. I can, you know, get historical prices. I can, you know, get the dividends, the stock splits, etc. And I can also get daily, weekly, or monthly data. Once I've gotten this the way I want it, what I'll do is I'll click download and it'll automatically download into Excel. So now let's take a look at this after I've gotten it into Excel. So here we go. I took one year's worth of daily data for Google. And as you can see, we've got a huge amount here. We've got about 251 days. I guess if I click on everything, oh, minus the previous year, there we go. We have 252 trading days worth of data here to play around with. That represents every trading day in 2015. Now. I've already put this data into a spreadsheet. I've, you know, just copied it directly from a downloaded Excel file. Uh, but what we're going to do is we are going to take this historical data and we're going to calculate the historical return and the historical volatility of Google over this one year time period. Uh, you're going to see how we calculate returns in the real world, how we calculate standard deviation and variance in the real world. Uh, and I think this is pretty good. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so let me zoom in here so you can see things more easily. Uh, first things first, we need to calculate returns. So what I'll do is I'll take the price at the end of the day using the adjusted closing price minus the adjusted closing price at the end of the prior day, all divided by the adjusted closing price at the end of the prior day. You might ask, why don't I use the open? Well, because these you know, stocks trade after hours. Notice that there's a difference here between the price at close 
and the next day is open. So we go from close to close or adjusted close to adjusted close. And there we have our return. Uh, to make this simpler, I could copy this down like that, or I could just go to the bottom right and double click. And now I've calculated all of the returns for all of these days. Now, ultimately, if I get down here to the bottom, what you're going to see is that I have a divide by zero error. Now, the reason I have a divide by zero error is because I'm calculating a return where my, my denominator is a blank. Uh, so what we typically do here is we just null this out. Uh, I collected one more day than was necessary. So I collected the last trading day of 2014 just so I could get the return on the first trading day of 2015, which was negative 30 bips. Okay, so as I go up here, I now have my returns. Uh, now I, I'm going to want to calculate the geometric daily return, the average daily, the arithmetic average daily return. Let's do that first. Uh, so first things first, uh, let's calculate our arithmetic average daily return, and that's going to be just our average of these returns. There we go, about 16 bips. Next, we want our geometric daily mean return. Uh, so uh, to get that, there's a couple things I could do. I'm, I'm actually just going to completely disregard this cell. Uh, what I'll do is I'll take the one plus returns, so equals one plus return, and I'm going to copy that down and blank this last one because, you know, it's, it's based on missing data. There we go. And our geometric daily return, I probably should just rephrase this, shouldn't I? Geometric daily return is going to be equals geo mean. Highlight my one plus returns and subtract one. And there we go. My geometric average return is about 15 basis points. Let me just go out a few more places. So it's, you know, a little low. Uh, so that's that. Next, we want our daily volatility, so our daily return volatility. And for that, we just use the standard deviation formula, STDEV. And I've got a couple choices of standard deviations to use, you know, div A, P, S. Uh, remember, I, I did mention in the last video that we want to use the sample standard deviation. Why? Because we only have a sample of the data. We don't have a population. We don't have the entirety of Google's return data. So I'm going to use this stdev.s and highlight all of my returns. Uh, so actually what I'm doing to get these faster is hitting control shift down, and this will highlight every return in this column. Close my parentheses, and there we go. Okay, so now we've got our daily geometric mean, arithmetic mean, and volatility. To scale these up, I'm just going to use my formulas that I, I talked about in the last video. So equals one plus my geometric daily mean to the power of 252 minus one. So we're going from daily to annual. We have 252 trading days in a year. There we go. My Google's return over that period was about 44.96%. And its annual return or volatility was just our daily volatility times the square root of 252. Remember, we're going from daily volatility to annual volatility, so we're putting in the square root of the number of days during that trading year, 252. So there we go. Uh, so, you know, volatility of 0.2949 or 29%-ish uh, QED. Okay, now let's try a little more complicated example. Uh, 
what we'll do is I've already collected this data, so we'll actually disregard this part, but I'm going to ask you to consider an investment in Apple, Apple stock. Calculate the firm's daily and annual return and return volatility over a five-year period. So we have this five-year period from 1-1-2019 to 12-31-2023, and uh, we're just going to take a look at this. So I've already talked about how to get this data in the Google example just a few seconds ago, so I'm just going to skip this part and just go straight to the data. So here we go. We have our data arranged from newest to oldest, all the way down here. Uh, I do have one day's worth of returns for uh, Apple, so the last trading day of the year, it had an adjusted closing price of 37.75. I'll need that number to get the return on the first trading day of 2019. Uh, also, just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to freeze these panes on the top row. So if I go all the way to the bottom again, notice here, like actually see this is the adjusted close. Okay, so first things first, we're going to calculate the daily return. So equals adjusted closing price minus previous day's adjusted closing price, all divided by adjusted closing price in the previous day. Copy that down. So I'm going all the way to the bottom. Notice here that I have a divide by zero error here. That's because I don't have any data for the denominator in this last cell. Uh, we don't, we're, we're calculating the returns over 2019 through 2023. So I don't actually need the return in the last trading day of 2018. So I'm gonna delete that. All right, next, uh, I'll do another geo mean calculation here just for, you know, just so you can see it. Uh, so I'll get my one plus daily returns, one plus return, copy that down, go to the bottom. So control shift down and delete this 100%. And now I can do some calculations. So our geometric mean daily return equals geo mean. close parentheses, minus one. There we go. Arithmetic mean daily return equals average. Daily variance equals, well, var dot s variance or sample variance. So, you know, I could do this like this or because variance is standard deviation squared, I could just take the sample standard deviation and take it to, you know, just square square it. Uh, daily standard deviation at equals e stdev.s. Highlight my daily returns. And our, now we've got that, we can scale these up to annual metrics. So annual return. I'll use my arithmetic mean daily return. So equals one plus my arithmetic mean daily return to the power of 252 minus my principal of one. There we go. And my annual standard deviation is going to be daily standard deviation times the square root of 252. Lastly, I didn't talk about these in uh, any video so far, but there are two other metrics that we sometimes consider when we talk about uh, probability distribution. Uh, so skewness, this indicate, indicates whether we have a, a long right tail or a long left tail. Uh, typically, our, our skewness should be zero for a, stand, for a normal distribution. Uh, the calculation here is SKEW, and we'll just highlight our daily returns. Okay, so it's pretty small close to zero, not a big deal. Kurtosis indicates how fat the body of this normal distribution is. So if we had, you know, just a, you know, something that did this and came down and then had very long tails, uh, that would indicate that we've got some uh, kurtosis issues here. But basically our kurtosis metric should be uh, an average of three. Uh, 
anything above one is typically going to indicate that this is an, an okay normal distribution where we, you know, our, our mean is centered around the median and mode. All right, so equals Kurt. And there we go. So, okay, we've, you know, we've got a fat body, skinny tails. So that's, it's not ideal, but it's, it's not horrible, uh, I guess is probably the best way to put that. There's some tests out there, but that's well beyond, you know, what we're talking about in this class. But here we have a, a histogram of Apple's returns. Uh, obviously, you can see that there's definitely something that looks like a normal distribution here centered on, oh, about, what is this, uh, 0.15 as our, our mean, thereabouts. Uh, we do have some skew way the heck out here. We have some some values that are, say, 8% or negative 8% thereabouts. Uh, but this generally supports our basic hypothesis that returns are typically normally distributed. All right, now that we've kind of gone through the process where we clean data and calculate historical arithmetic return and volatility on various securities, Let's talk about probability distributions of returns. Uh, as you saw in that histogram that we just calculated, uh, we do have something close to a normal distribution when it comes to returns. We generally assume that stock returns follow a normal distribution. In other words, the expected return in that distribution uh, should also equal the median and the mode. The plot of a normal distribution is that classic bell curve that we, we like to see, uh, and the return probabilities are symmetric around the mean. Now, the reason we typically like to assume that a, a return distribution is normally distributed is, well, I guess there's several reasons. First, uh, this means that you can use standard deviation as your primary measure of risk. Uh, if you don't have that symmetric bell curve, normal distribution, generally the standard deviation doesn't indicate the same thing. Uh, second, if the returns on every security are normally distributed in your portfolio, this means that the returns of any portfolio formed by those securities is also going to have normal distribution. Uh, so we'll see the benefits of assuming that every security is normally distributed uh, later on in this class, but basically, if securities are normally distributed, we can use more advanced tools than just standard deviation and mean. We can start to use things like the Sharpe Ratio and the VAR, which we'll talk about in a bit. All right, so what is the Sharpe Ratio? Now, the Sharpe Ratio is a risk-adjusted return measure. You scale the quantity, or rather the, uh, the return on a security, minus your risk-free rate, which we'll talk about in a second, by uh, essentially your your volatility or risk. So you're, I mean, with the sharp ratio, you're taking uh, return on a security minus the risk-free rate divided by the risk associated with this security. And what you get is kind of like this risk-adjusted metric that allows you to compare one security with another security. Uh, once you control for risk, which security is best? That's essentially what the sharp ratio says. Uh, now. We do have a couple things here. Uh, notice here that we have the expected return on stock I, but basically our risk premium is the difference between the expected return on a risky asset and the risk-free rate, whereas we can also have something called an excess return, which is basically like the, the realized return on a stock minus the realized risk-free rate. So this is, you know, if we're talking about expected returns, uh, we would have a risk premium. If we're talking about the actual returns that just happened, that would be an excess return. Uh, now, the return on the stock, we've already talked about how to calculate it. The standard deviation, we've already calculated it. Let's talk about the risk-free rate. The risk-free rate is some metric, some return in an economy that is seen as having absolutely no risk. We'll talk about this a lot in the coming weeks, but in the U.S., the typical risk-free rate is the yield on a U.S. government security, like a T-bill or a T-bond or a T-note. The reason it's said to be risk-free is because the U.S. federal government has never defaulted on its debt, and therefore 
uh, it's seen as, you know, there's, there's no risk of default here. Basically, whatever you're promised is what you're going to be given. And so typically, the risk-free rate is going to be lower than your risk, your return on a risky security. So that's that. Now, what happens if returns aren't normally distributed? Well, if returns aren't normally distributed, what this means is that there might be another measure like skewness or kurtosis that more appropriately captures the risk of an asset. It also means that that sharp ratio I just showed you uh, whose standard deviation is the denominator is not going to be a good measure of risk adjusted returns. So, you know, we want our returns to be normally distributed, but if they're not, a lot of metrics like the sharp ratio, which I just showed you, just completely fall apart and you can't use them. All right, so how else can we manage risk? Well, there are tools outside of the sharp ratio we can use to manage and measure risk when returns are normally distributed. Uh, you probably remember confidence intervals from your statistics course. Uh, well, here's an example of how we can use those confidence intervals in the real world. It's a good thing too, because you know, we need, you know, <laughs> we need this, you know, those things to be relevant. Okay, so uh, what you're looking at right here is kind of this, this graphical interpretation of what we call value at risk. It's essentially an estimate of how much and you might lose on a given investment with some probability. Now, your typical VAR or value at risk is going to be at the 5% level. And what this says is that this value, this VAR of 5% is the amount that you can expect to lose more than 5% of the time. It's essentially the lower bound on a confidence interval. So 95% of the time, you're going to not, you're, you're going to have a return that's higher than this VAR of 0.05 and 5% of the time you're going to have a return or, or value that's less than this value. So this VAR kind of gives us an indication of downside risk. So, I mean, I, I guess that's kind of it. We have VAR that of 0.05. We can also have VAR of 0.01. And that VAR of 0.01 would correspond to the lower tail of a 99% confidence interval. So the, the formula we typically use is we have our mean return, whatever our return is, minus the Z statistic from your, your statistics class, that's just the, the normal distribution statistic, times the standard deviation of your random variable. So you know, if we are trying to get VAR of 0.05, so the lower bound on a 95% or a, a on a confidence interval where you have 5% below the confidence interval and 5% above, uh, basically we take our mean return minus 1.65 times the standard deviation. And if we wanted to get the VAR of 0.01, we just take mean return minus 2.33, so the Z statistic at that uh, that dis that point times our standard deviation. So let me just, again, graphically show this. Uh, the VAR of 0.05 says that there's 5% probability that the next outcome of this random variable will be below this VAR of 0.05. The 1% VAR is way out here, and it indicates that 1% of the possible observations in the future will be uh, less than this VAR of 0.01. We don't really talk about this stuff out here. VAR is kind of like a how much can you expect to lose with some degree of certainty metric. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. So I pulled some time series data on monthly returns of the S&P 500 beginning in 1926, and we'll calculate the VAR at the 5% level, the VAR at the 1% level, and the Sharpe ratio. Okay, so here we have our data. Uh, I took as much data as I could from something called the Words Database. Uh, I mentioned CRISP a few moments ago in this video. Basically, what you're looking at is data that I collected from the CRISP database. It goes from uh, 1926 all the way to, well, the latest data I have is the end of 2023. So we have a fairly large time series here. And I pulled monthly return data. So I have the returns on the S&P 500 in each month. And I've got, you know, one plus returns if we were using geometric, which we won't. 
Uh, we'll use arithmetic returns in this case. Uh, I have the one month T-bill rate, which is going to be our risk-free rate, uh, which allows us to calculate our Sharpe ratio. So let's go ahead and we'll start off getting our arithmetic monthly return. So I'll just highlight my returns. Okay. Looks like I have some missing data here. Don't quite know why. I'm just going to remove that. There we go. So let me just try this again. Okay. So my mean monthly return is 65 basis points. That's pretty good. Uh, next, we'll calculate the arithmetic mean monthly risk-free rate. So I'll just take this. There we go. Oh, I did something wrong. There we go, 27 bips. Monthly standard deviation on the S&P 500 index. So again, standard deviation, stevedev.s. I'll highlight this. And maybe it's, it'd be helpful if I zoomed in. There we go. Okay. Uh, next, we want to use the VAR at the 5% level. Uh, and to get that, we need to know our Z statistic at the 5% level. Uh, now, in Excel, there's a formula out there called the norm S inv function. So equals norm s inv. And what this will do is it'll tell you the z statistic at a given probability. So if I wanted to get the 5% lower bound, I'd put in 0.05. And this tells me that the, the z statistic at the 5% lower bound is, I'll zoom this out so you can see it, but, you know, 1.6449. So, you know, round this to... Uh, I guess technically it rounds to negative 1.64. Uh, the 1% 1 lower bound is norm S inv at 0.01, so 2.33 or negative 2.33. And so using this, we can calculate the value at risk at the 95 or at the 5% level. And that's just going to be our arithmetic monthly return plus our negative 5% bound times the monthly standard deviation. So what this really says, and I'll, you know, I guess you can kind of see this in the comment I wanted to leave, but basically your VAR at 0.05 says that this is the return that you are expected to beat next month with 95% certainty. And you're expected to beat this number, which is negative 8.2%. So 5% of the time, based on this historical data, you will have a return less than negative 8.2%. 95% of the time, it's going to be greater than that. Now let's get our VAR at the 1% level. So mean plus the negative 2.33 times standard deviation. And so obviously this is going to be more negative because there's fewer observations that could occur. Uh, so there. All right, now let's get our sharp ratio. So we've already got our monthly mean return. Uh, we do, however, to get our sharp ratio, we do need to annualize that. So I'm going to take this monthly return and scale this up. So one plus my monthly re equals one plus my monthly return. Let's try that again to the power of 12 minus one. There we go. Our annualized risk-free rate is just one plus our monthly risk-free rate to the power of 12 minus one. Annualized standard deviation of this index, so equals monthly standard deviation, and we're scaling up from one month to 12 months, so we're multiplying this by the square root of 12. Annual excess return uh, this is going to be just the difference between the return on the security that we're analyzing, in this case the index, minus the risk-free rate. 
So there it is. Our excess return annually is about 4.86%. And our annualized sharp ratio is just, I'll do the entire formula. It's the return minus the risk-free rate divided by the standard deviation. And there we go. If we wanted to know how good this index was at returning, uh, offering good returns, we would want to compare this sharp ratio to the sharp ratio of other indexes that are made up by other securities. So, you know, we use this for comparison purposes. Okay, now before I wrap up this video, I do need to mention some of the drawbacks of assuming that returns are normally distributed. The first drawback is that unlike the normal distribution, which has bounds of negative infinity and positive infinity, your minimum return is bounded at 100%. Uh, this is because you can only lose what you invested. In other words, in the real world, the left tail of the distrib distribution is a bit shorter than it would be in theory. Now, secondly, uh, as you'll see later in this course, investors aren't rational. Investors tend to buy hot stocks like NVIDIA in 2023, 2024, and they when they buy these stocks up, they bid the price of that stock beyond the intrinsic value, and they'll sell stocks below their intrinsic value for a variety of reasons. Basically, uh, investor irrationality leads to bubbles and prices essentially becoming decoupled from their intrinsic values. Uh, we'll cover behavioral finance later in this course, but suffice it to say that retail investors tend to want to hold stocks that are well-marketed or well-known, or for lack of better a better word, they're sexy, kind of like Tesla has been in the early 2020s. Uh, now, finally, the normal dis distribution does not account for fraud. The return of a stock will be very negative if a serious case of fraud is discovered, like the Enron accounting scandal. In the real world, there are more negative returns due to fraud than the normal distribution would suggest. In other words, we have these very, very large one-day negative returns uh, that you know the normal distribution doesn't predict because you know people are people and people commit fraud. Uh, so what I'm trying to get here is that we do have some reasons to believe that returns are not normally distributed. Okay, so why do we assume that returns are normally distributed? Well, the answer is simple. In order to do productive research and good analysis in investments, uh, basically we need some framework. Assuming normality as allows us to use a lot of very, very simple concepts and you know perform some very very simple analysis that allows us to extract value i mean basically the benefits of assuming that stocks stock returns are normally distributed are better are significantly larger than the drawbacks however if you're wondering what distribution stocks typically follow like actually follow it's not actually the normal distribution it's actually the the log normal distribution which is very very similar but basically it's what the not log normal distribution is said says is that when you take the natural log of one plus your returns that number is normally distributed so here i have a just a quick map mapping of the log normal distribution uh, so there we go all right so what did we talk about in this section? Well, we talked about how historical pricing data is used to calculate stock returns and volatility. We introduced the Sharpe ratio as a measure of risk-adjusted return. We introduced the value at risk, which is a valuable tool for estimating the downside risk of an asset or a portfolio. And I talked about the fact that, well, returns are not exactly normally distributed, Assuming that these returns are normally distributed allows us to use a lot of advanced statistical techniques that we otherwise could not use. So with that, I'm going to conclude, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.